Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another Deep Dive. Today we're tackling a topic that I think is going to resonate with pretty much every dungeon master out there. Uh, and probably a lot of players too. Dealing with difficult players at the D&D table. We'll be drawing inspiration from a fantastic article from Lit RPG Reads titled How to Deal with Difficult Player Behavior in D&D Tabletop RPG Sessions. And of course a huge shout out to Paul Bello. Fine fellow for pointing us towards this, Jim. Absolutely. You know, just thinking about the topic brings back some uh, some interesting memories from my own D&D days. Oh, I bet I can only imagine. I once had this player who was so obsessed with min-maxing his character, it was like he was playing a spreadsheet simulator instead of D&D. I mean, hours yeah. spent poring over rule books, meticulously calculating stats, agonizing over every single feat and ability choice. The classic min-max. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I appreciate a well-optimized character as much as the next DM. But this was next level. Mm. It was like pulling teeth, trying to get him to engage with the story beyond just how can I maximize my damage output or what's the most efficient way to clear this dungeon. It was a constant struggle to remind him that D&D is about more than just mechanics. It's about collaborative storytelling, creating a shared experience, you know. That's a delicate balance, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Mm. And that's where this Let RPG Reads article comes in handy. It breaks down the different types of challenging players we encounter and offers some practical strategies for managing those behaviors. So let's dive in, shall we? Sounds good to me. First up, we've got the min-maxer, mm -hmm. as we've already touched upon. The article describes them as players who prioritize maximizing their character's mechanical effectiveness above all else. They're obsessed with stats, feats, abilities, always looking for that edge in combat or skill checks. Right. They're the masters of efficiency, always seeking the optimal, build the perfect combination of race class and abilities to squeeze out every ounce of power. And, you know, their strategic minds can actually be a real asset in challenging combat encounters. Oh, for sure. If you need someone to consistently land those critical hits or have the perfect spell prepared for every situation, the Min Maxer is your go to champion. But as we've already seen, their laser focus on mechanics can sometimes come at the expense of role-playing and narrative immersion. You hit the nail on the head. It's like they're so focused on the numbers that they forget to inhabit their characters and engage with the story on a deeper level. Think of it this way. They might choose a feat that grants them a plus two bonus to attack rolls over a feat that ties into their character's backstory or opens up interesting role-playing opportunities. They might prioritize a mechanically powerful race over a race that aligns with their character's personality or the campaign setting. Right. It's like their character sheet becomes a spreadsheet rather than a reflection of a living, breathing character with motivations, flaws, and aspirations. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with enjoying the strategic side of character creation, it's crucial to encourage min-maxers to embrace the narrative as well. After all, D&D is a collaborative storytelling experience, not just a tactical combat simulator. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. So how do we as dungeon masters or fellow players help min-maxers step outside those spreadsheets and into the vibrant world of role-playing? How do we bridge that gap between mechanics and narrative? Well, one effective strategy is to emphasize the role-playing opportunities within the game. Instead of just throwing combat encounters at them, design scenarios that reward creative problem-solving, social interaction, and character development. Okay, I like where you're going with this. Uh, so instead of just kill the monster, get the loot, it's more about navigating complex social situations, uncovering hidden secrets through clever role-playing, or making difficult moral choices that test their character's convictions. Precisely. Give them a chance to shine outside of combat. Present them with dilemmas that force them to think beyond optimal combat strategies and consider the consequences of their actions. Maybe their carefully chosen feats tie into their character's backstory in a way that presents a unique challenge, or their optimized abilities grant them an advantage in social situations they hadn't anticipated. Oh, that's clever. So their obsession with optimization actually becomes a narrative element. Their meticulously crafted character build isn't just a tool for combat, it's a springboard for storytelling and role-playing. I'm digging this approach. It's about finding that sweet spot where their strategic prowess complements the storytelling rather than competing with it. Remember, a well-rounded D&D experience encompasses both mechanics and narrative. Absolutely. Speaking of well-rounded, another type of player that the Lit RPG Reads article highlights is the rules lawyer. Now, we all know a rules lawyer or two. Ah, yes, the guardians of the rule books, the walking encyclopedias of game mechanics, their dedication to the rules can be admirable, especially for newer dungeon masters who might be navigating the complexities of the system for the first time. Oh, for sure. Having a player who can quickly reference a specific rule or clarify a tricky situation can be a lifesaver. 
But as we all know, there's a fine line between helpful clarification and, well, let's just say excessive rule lawyering. Indeed. The challenge with rules lawyers is that their focus on adhering to the letter of the law can sometimes overshadow the spirit of the game, that collaborative storytelling experience we all crave. Right. It's like they're trying to turn the game into a courtroom drama where every ruling is subject to intense scrutiny and cross-examination. And while a healthy respect for the rules is important, it shouldn't come at the expense of narrative flow and player enjoyment. Imagine you're describing a tense moment. The party is sneaking through a shadowy forest, every creak and groan heightening the suspense. Oh, I can picture it now. They're on edge senses, heightened listening for any sign of danger. And then, bam, the rules lawyer pipes up. Hang on, based on my character's passive perception score, wouldn't they automatically detect any hidden enemies within a 30-foot radius? Talk about a mood killer. It's like, <laughs> yes, we appreciate your knowledge of the rules, but can we maybe let this story breathe a little? Save the legal debate for later? Precisely. Acknowledging their knowledge, but also emphasizing the importance of narrative flow is key. Finding that balance is crucial for creating a satisfying experience for everyone at the table. So how do we navigate these choppy waters? How do we as dungeon masters, or even as fellow players, channel the rules lawyer's enthusiasm in a way that benefits everyone? One strategy is to establish clear expectations from the start. During session zero, have an open conversation about how rules will be handled. Emphasize that while rules provide a framework for the game, they shouldn't overshadow the collaborative storytelling aspect. Session zero. I love that concept. It's like a pregame huddle where everyone gets on the same page, aligns their expectations, and sets the tone for the campaign. Exactly. And during that session, Surya, you can establish some ground rules specific to rule adjudication. For example, you might agree to use a specific edition of the rule books to minimize disputes. You could establish a system where the dungeon master makes a ruling in the moment and any disagreements or clarifications can be discussed after the session, preserving the flow of the game. That's a great approach. It sets boundaries while still acknowledging the importance of rules clarity, and it prevents those mid-game interruptions that can derail the story and frustrate other players. Another helpful tactic is to encourage rules lawyers to phrase their questions in character. So instead of saying, hey, can my rogue use expertise on this lockpicking check? They might ask, hmm, these tumblers seem familiar. Perhaps I've encountered a similar mechanism before. Ooh, I like that. It keeps them engaged with the story and encourages them to think from their character's perspective, even when dealing with rules. It's all about finding creative ways to work with these players, not against them. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, a truly epic D&D &D experience. Absolutely. Speaking of epic, the next player type we'll be tackling is the power gamer. This is the player who thrives on in-game influence, who seeks to dominate the game world and bend it to their will. They're the masterminds, the strategists, the ones who see the game world as a chessboard, and every move they make is calculated to increase their power and influence. All right, hold on a second. Before we dive into the power gamer, I need to grab a refill. This deep dive is making me thirsty. We'll be back in a flash to dissect the complexities of the power gamer and explore strategies for channeling their ambition in a way that benefits the entire group. Sounds like a plan. All right, welcome back. Ah, much better. Ready to tackle those power gamers? We're picturing the player who's always angling for the most powerful magic items, scheming to take control of kingdoms, and maybe even manipulating their fellow party members to further their own ambitions. That's a pretty accurate picture of a power gamer in their element. Their drive for dominance can lead to some thrilling moments, especially when they pull off those clutch victories against seemingly impossible odds. But as with any player type, their strengths can also become potential challenges if not managed carefully. I bet I can imagine those thrilling moments turning into tense ones if other players start feeling like they're being overshadowed or sidelined. It's supposed to be a collaborative game after all, not a one-person show. That's a valid concern. The power gamer's desire for control can sometimes lead to an imbalance in the group dynamic. They might prioritize their own goals and ambitions over the needs of the party, or they might try to manipulate other players to get their way. So how do we as dungeon masters, or even as fellow players, help power gamers find that balance between personal ambition and collaborative storytelling? How do we channel that drive for power in a way that benefits the entire group? One effective strategy is to design encounters that require teamwork and strategy where everyone's contributions are essential for success. Instead of presenting challenges that can be overcome by a single powerful character, create scenarios that demand diverse skills and perspectives. Okay, I like this approach. 
So instead of being all about who has the biggest sword or the most powerful spell, it becomes about how the party can leverage their individual strengths to overcome a challenge as a team. Exactly. Give the power gamer opportunities to shine as a leader and a strategist, but within a framework that requires them to rely on and value the contributions of their fellow party members. Maybe you design a dungeon where different characters need to solve puzzles or overcome obstacles based on their unique abilities. The power gamer can lead the charge, but they can't succeed without the rogue's stealth, the wizard's arcane knowledge, or the cleric's healing powers. That's a great example. It turns the game into a collaborative puzzle, where each player's unique skills are essential pieces of the solution. And in doing so, you're subtly shifting the power gamer's focus from individual dominance to collective achievement. Precisely. And this shift can be incredibly satisfying for both the power gamer and the rest of the group. Okay, I'm starting to see how this works. So collaborative challenges, shared goals. What other tricks do we have up our sleeves to help these power gamers find their place within the collaborative spirit of D&D? Another effective tactic is to weave their desire for power into their character's backstory and motivations. Instead of simply being power hungry for the sake of it, give their ambition a deeper meaning. Okay, I'm intrigued. So instead of just being, I want to rule the world, it becomes more about exploring the why behind that ambition. Exactly. Maybe they're seeking power to right a past wrong to protect those they care about, or to bring about a more just and equitable society. Hmm. I can see how that would add a layer of depth and complexity to the character. It's not just about accumulating power for its own sake. It's about using that power to achieve a meaningful goal. Precisely. Mm. And by tying their ambition to a compelling backstory and motivations, you're not just giving the power gamer a reason to seek power. You're giving them a reason to work with the party to achieve those goals. Because now their personal goals are intertwined with the party's shared objectives. Mm. It's no longer about individual dominance. It's about working together to achieve something greater than themselves. That's the idea. And by reframing their drive for power within a narrative context that benefits the entire group, you can create a truly engaging and satisfying experience for everyone. So we've tackled the min-maxer, the rules lawyer, and the power gamer, each with their unique set of challenges and opportunities. Indeed. But wait, there's more. The Litter RPG Reads article also dives into another player type that can be particularly tricky, the metagamer. Ah, yes, the metagamer, the one who walks the tightrope between player knowledge and character knowledge. So this is the player who might use information they've learned outside of the game to influence their character's decisions, like knowing about a trap because they read the module beforehand, or making assumptions about a non-player character's motivations based on their knowledge of classic fantasy tropes. Exactly. And while this often stems from a place of enthusiasm and a deep familiarity with the game, it can create an unfair advantage and disrupt the immersive experience for other players. I can see how that would be frustrating. You're trying to experience the story organically, making decisions based on what your character knows, mm. and suddenly someone's pulling maneuvers based on information they shouldn't have. It's like watching a movie with somebody who keeps spoiling the plot twists. Precisely. It can break the immersion and make other players feel like their choices don't really matter. So how do you handle a metagamer? Because simply telling them to forget what they know isn't exactly a realistic solution. It's definitely not that simple. And approaching the situation requires sensitivity and understanding. Remember, most metagamers aren't trying to ruin the game for others. They're often just caught up in their excitement and their desire to be in the know. Okay, so shaming them or accusing them of cheating isn't the way to go. What's a more constructive approach? One effective strategy is to gently remind them to play from their character's perspective. Instead of saying, you know, that's a trap, right? You might ask, what would your character do knowing what they know? This encourages them to step back into their character's shoes and make decisions based on the information available within the game world. That's a great tip. It subtly nudges them back into that immersive mindset without making them feel like they're being punished for their knowledge. Exactly. And remember, sometimes a little humor can go a long way. If a player is clearly metagaming, you might gently tease them saying something like, oh, is your character suddenly psychic? I didn't realize they had those abilities. I like that. It lightens the mood and helps them realize that their metagaming is noticeable without being overly confrontational. It's about striking that balance between addressing the behavior and maintaining a positive and fun atmosphere. Speaking of fun, sometimes the fun can be sucked right out of the room when you encounter a truly disruptive player. 
The one who's constantly talking over others, making inappropriate jokes, or deliberately derailing the plot just for kicks. Ah, yes, the disruptive player. The one who seems to thrive on chaos and attention, often at the expense of the other player's enjoyment. And this isn't just about someone being a bit quirky or having a different sense of humor. This is about behavior that actively undermines the collaborative spirit of D&D and makes it difficult for others to enjoy the game. That's an important distinction. A disruptive player isn't just someone who's a little offbeat. They're someone whose actions actively hinder the group's ability to tell a story together. All right, so let's tackle this head on. How do we handle a player who's being disruptive? Because it's one thing to gently nudge a metagamer or redirect a rules lawyer, but this seems like it might require a firmer hand. You're right. Dealing with a disruptive player often requires a more direct approach. But even then, it's crucial to approach the situation with respect and a desire to understand the root of the problem. Okay, so before jumping to conclusions or resorting to harsh punishments, it's important to try and figure out why they're being disruptive. Mm. Are they bored, feeling ignored, seeking attention? Maybe they're just having a bad day and projecting their frustrations onto the game. Exactly. Understanding the underlying cause can help you address the behavior more effectively. It allows you to tailor your response to the specific situation rather than just reacting generically. So instead of just saying, hey, stop talking over everyone, it's about having a conversation about why they're feeling the need to do that. And that conversation might need to happen outside the game session itself in a private and respectful setting where they feel more comfortable opening up. That's a great point. A one-on-one -on -one chat can be much more productive than trying to address the issue in front of the whole group, where the player might feel embarrassed or defensive. It's about fostering a sense of trust and open communication, letting them know that you care about their experience and want to find a solution that works for everyone. Precisely. And remember, the goal is not to punish or shame them, but to find a solution that allows everyone to enjoy the game. Okay, so communication and understanding are key. Yeah. But what about setting boundaries? Because sometimes, despite our best efforts, certain behaviors just can't be tolerated. You're absolutely right. And this is where setting clear boundaries comes in. It's about being upfront about what kind of behavior is acceptable at the gaming table and what isn't. So this could be things like no side conversations during gameplay, respect everyone's turn to speak, or let's keep the jokes appropriate for the tone of the game. Exactly. And having those boundaries clearly established can make it easier to address disruptive behavior when it occurs. Because then it's not a matter of personal preference or a subjective opinion. It's about upholding the agreed upon rules of engagement. Precisely. And remember, enforcing those boundaries consistently is crucial. If you let things slide one time, it sends the message that those boundaries are flexible which can make it harder to address similar behavior in the future. Right, consistency is key. It shows that you're serious about creating a respectful and enjoyable gaming environment for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we've now covered five distinct types of challenging players. The rules lawyer, the min-maxer, the power gamer, the metagamer, and the disruptive player. Each presenting unique challenges and opportunities for growth. And while we've touched upon some specific strategies for dealing with each player type, it seems like there are some overarching principles that can be applied across the board, some fundamental approaches that can help create a more harmonious and enjoyable gaming experience for everyone, regardless of the specific personalities and play styles at your table. Absolutely. These are the foundational pillars of a healthy and thriving D&D &D group. Okay, let's build those pillars. What are some of those essential strategies for managing difficult players, no matter their particular quirks? Welcome back. So we've talked about specific types of players and how to handle them, but are there like some general tips or tricks that dungeon masters can use to just like set themselves up for success? Oh, absolutely. There are definitely some proactive strategies you can employ to create a more harmonious gaming environment and hopefully head off some of these issues before they even arise. Okay. I'm all ears. Let's talk prevention. Yeah. What are some of those proactive measures that dungeon masters can take? One of the most important things, and we touched upon this earlier, is being mindful of who you invite to your game. Ah, so this is about being selective about your gaming circle. In a way, yes. It's not about being exclusive or judgmental, but it's about recognizing that not every player is a good fit for every group. Right. Even with the best intentions, sometimes personalities just clash or playstyles don't mesh, and those mismatches can create friction and really detract from the enjoyment of the game. Exactly. Right. So before you embark on a new campaign, take some time to consider the dynamics of your group and the kind of experience you want to create. Okay, so let's say you're putting together a group for a new campaign. 
what are some things you can do to kind of get a sense of whether potential players will be a good fit? Well, one approach is to have an open and honest conversation with potential players about their expectations, their preferred play styles, and their experience with D&D. So like a pregame interview. Exactly. You might ask them questions like, have you played D&D before? What kind of character do you enjoy playing? What are your expectations for role playing versus combat? What are some things that you absolutely love about D&D? And just as importantly, what are some things that you absolutely hate? Those are great questions. It's like a little sneak peek into their D&D soul. Right. Those answers can give you valuable insights into whether a player's priorities and play style align with the kind of campaign you're envisioning. Mm. If someone's talking about always wanting to be the center of attention or dominating combat encounters, yeah. that might be a red flag if you're aiming for a more collaborative, story-driven campaign. Exactly. And if you're running a game with a specific theme or tone, you can also mention that up front and see how potential players react. Right. If you're planning a gritty, horror-themed campaign, you might say something like, this game will explore some dark themes and mature content. Are you comfortable with that? Precisely. Their response can tell you a lot about whether they're a good fit for the kind of story you want to tell. Okay, so having those conversations, being upfront about expectations, and just being observant are all crucial for assembling a group that's likely to gel well. But what about situations where you're playing with a pre-existing group of friends? Do these screening strategies still apply? They can, but it requires a more delicate touch. You can't exactly screen out your friends, right? Yeah, that would be a tough conversation. Sorry, you're not a good fit for my D&D group. Exactly. But you can still have those conversations about expectations, play styles, and boundaries. It might feel a little awkward at first, but framing it as a way to ensure everyone has fun and feels comfortable can make a big difference. So maybe it's about having a pre-campaign hangout where you say something like, Hey guys, I'm really excited about running this new game, but I want to make sure it's fun for everyone. Let's chat about what kind of game we want to play and how we can make sure it's a positive experience for all of us. Exactly. And by framing it that way, you're emphasizing the collaborative nature of D&D. You're not dictating terms. You're inviting everyone to participate in shaping the experience. Okay, so we've talked about having those pregame conversations and being mindful of who you invite to the game. What other proactive strategies can Dungeon Masters employ to kind of set the stage for a smoother campaign? Another crucial strategy is establishing a clear code of conduct. This is about putting those expectations and boundaries in writing, creating a shared document that everyone can refer to throughout the campaign. So it's not just about what's said during those pregame chats. It's about having a written agreement, a set of guidelines that everyone understands and agrees to uphold. Precisely. And this code of conduct doesn't have to be a long legalistic document. It can be a simple bullet point list of key principles that everyone agrees to abide by. Okay, so what are some of those essential elements that should be included in a D&D code of conduct? Well, some of the key principles to consider are respect for all players, respect for the dungeon master's decisions, open communication, a commitment to inclusivity and clear procedures for conflict resolution. Okay, let's break those down. Respect for all players seems pretty straightforward. It's about treating everyone with kindness and consideration, regardless of their experience level, play style, or background. Exactly. And it's about creating a welcoming and inclusive environment where everyone feels comfortable expressing themselves and contributing to the game. Right, because D&D should be a fun and safe space for everyone involved. Absolutely. Now, respect for the Dungeon Master's decisions is another important principle. So this is about recognizing that the Dungeon Master has the final say in how the game is run and respecting their authority to make rulings and guide the story. Exactly. And this doesn't mean that players can't question rulings or offer suggestions, but it's about doing so respectfully and understanding that the dungeon master has the ultimate responsibility for maintaining the integrity of the game. That makes sense. It's like any collaborative project. There needs to be a leader who sets the direction and makes the final decisions. Uh -huh. Otherwise, it's just chaos. Precisely. Now, open communication is another crucial element of a successful D&D group. So this is about encouraging players to express their thoughts and feelings openly and honestly, both during and outside of the game. And it's about being receptive to feedback, even if it's not always what you want to hear. Exactly. And it's about creating an environment where feedback is welcomed and where players feel comfortable bringing up concerns or suggestions without fear of judgment or retaliation. 
Right, because bottling up those feelings can lead to resentment and conflict down the line. Absolutely. Open and honest communication allows the group to address issues proactively and make adjustments as needed to ensure everyone is having a positive experience. It's like preventative maintenance for your D&D group. I love that analogy. Okay, so we've got respect for players, respect for the dungeon master, mm -hmm. and open communication. What about commitment to inclusivity? Why is that important in a D&D &D context? That's a crucial one, especially in today's world. It's about creating a gaming space where everyone feels welcome and valued, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, or any other aspect of their identity. So this is about fostering a sense of belonging, making sure that everyone feels safe and respected and celebrating diversity rather than just tolerating it. Exactly. And it's about being mindful of the language we use, the stories we tell, and the characters we portray, ensuring that we're not perpetuating harmful stereotypes or excluding anyone from the shared experience. That's a powerful reminder. D&D at its core is about storytelling and imagination. And those stories should reflect the richness and diversity of the real world. Absolutely. And finally, a code of conduct should also include clear procedures for conflict resolution. So this is about having a plan in place for dealing with disagreements or disputes that might arise during the game. Because let's face it, even in the most harmonious groups, conflicts are bound to happen from time to time. That's the reality of any collaborative endeavor. And having a predetermined process for addressing those conflicts can help prevent them from escalating into bigger issues. So what might those procedures look like? Well, it could involve things like designating a neutral third party to mediate disputes, setting aside time outside of the game to discuss conflicts calmly and respectfully, or establishing a voting system for resolving disagreements in a fair and democratic way. The key is to have a plan in place before those conflicts arise, so you're not caught off guard and scrambling for solutions in the heat of the moment. That's great advice. It's about being prepared not just for the adventures within the game, but for the inevitable bumps along the road in real life. Exactly, and yeah. having those procedures in place can help de-escalate tensions, prevent misunderstandings, and find solutions that work for everyone involved. It's about turning those moments of conflict into opportunities for growth and understanding rather than letting them derail the campaign. I love that reframing. It's not about avoiding conflict altogether, but about approaching it constructively and using it to strengthen the bonds of the group. Precisely. And remember, even in those moments of disagreement, you're all still on the same team striving to create an amazing story together. That's a great point to end on. We've explored the challenges of dealing with difficult D&D &D players. We've uncovered effective strategies for navigating those challenges, and we've discovered the power of proactive measures to create a more harmonious and enjoyable gaming experience for everyone. And remember, there's a wealth of resources out there to support you on your D&D journey, from insightful articles and helpful YouTube channels to vibrant online communities and thought-provoking podcasts. There's a whole world of D&D wisdom waiting to be explored. Absolutely. And don't forget to check out Lit RPG Reads for more fantastic articles like the one that inspired this deep dive. They're a treasure trove of D&D knowledge. Couldn't agree more. And a final shout out to Paul Bellow, fine fellow. Always a pleasure. Until next time. May your dice rolls be ever in your favor and your adventures be legendary.